and also what the participants who actually go and have a dip there think of the occasion, what they make of it, what they take away from it. Then we have Daniela uh, Bevilacqua. <laughs> yes, Daniela Bevilacqua from Italy, who is now at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, where she has completed a PhD. And the subject to study, there may be many, but the ones I know about are the Ramanandi Sampradaya and the Vaishnav Sampradayas. And uh, she's been involved with, she told me, in a big project, of which the boss is the person sitting over there, James Balinson. He's also at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. He's a Sanskritist. He teaches there. And as you can make out from his Jatajut, he's the one genuine Jatajut Dhari who will be not out of place in the other kumbh at all. And he is into Hatha Yoga in a big way. My name is Harish Trivedi, and my only qualification for being on this panel is that I have been going to each kumbh at Allahabad since 1965. Allahabad is my hometown, so obviously that helped in getting me to the kumbh. Uh, later I came to Delhi, but my family stayed on, and I've been visiting them and the kumbh. Uh, why does one go to the kumbh? What happens at the kumb? All our panelists will say that. There is a visual aspect of the kumb that has become more and more prominent in this day of visuality, in this age of visuality. From what I've seen at the coverage of the Gumbha Mela this year, it's dominated by Naga Babas, those naked sadhus who wear only the bhasm. I do not know. I mean, there was a time not very long back until the 1977 kumbh, I think, or maybe the 1966 kumbh, when it was not the done thing to photograph them, when it was disrespectful to photograph them. That was before the explosion of handheld cameras, mobile phones, and television coverage for 24 hours on so many channels. They are not exhibitionists. They're not there on display for, of their nakedness. They are yogis. And one condition, when one is initiated into that cult, is the guru holds the penis of the initiate, as I understand it, and symbolically at least, breaks it in two places. Which means the killing of all sexual desire that only then are you privileged enough to go around the world naked. It's not, it's not what one takes it to be at first sight. There's a deeper commitment to the spiritual life and ascetic life among so many people who go there. Another thought that struck me here is, this, or this hall, is this venue is filling up, and by midday it'll be impossible to walk around. The greatest congregation in the world, the 150 million, is supposed to be at the Kumbh. But this also sometimes gives the impression of being another Kumbh. That is the religious Kumbh, this is the literary Kumbh, uh, on a much smaller scale, of course. And it struck me, an odd thought struck me, that there may not be many people at this Kumbh who will actually visit the other kumbh. So there is no overlap between the two. And I wonder if that's a good thing at all. If there are 150 million people out there who are doing it mainly out of belief, and we who have lost belief are here, and have perhaps not too much respect for that crowd, certainly not too much knowledge of that crowd, there is a divide between different kinds of people congregating for different reasons at venues like the Kumbh and venues like the JLF. There's something to think about. A little bit of overlap, a little bit of understanding, a little bit of sharing, perhaps, would not be such a bad thing. Our first speaker, whose name on the panel is not here, 
Avanisha Vasti. That's why I felt free to wax eloquent for a few minutes. We have saved some time there. Avanisha Vasti. Uh, I would have been pleasantly surprised if he had been able to make it. Because he's a very busy man, a very responsible man. He is uh, the principal secretary to the chief minister of UP. As an IAS officer, he is principal secretary to Yogi Adityanath. So I think it's better for him to be nearer the Kumbh than here. I will now invite Deshna and Sanjana to make their presentation, which will also contain visuals at the back. They will speak one after the other. Deshna. Thank you, Arishji. Uh, thank you all for being here. And like he said, it's a privilege to be here at the Kumbh Mela of Literature talking about the Kumbh itself. Um, I have a few, uh, we've got a few slides uh, which are here to your left. And we'd like to uh, share our journey of documenting uh, three Kumbh Melas so far. Starting out with the Kumbh Mela of uh, Allahabad in 2013, followed by Nasik uh, Trambakeshwar in 2015 and Ujjain in 2016. Uh, what's culminated from this documentation uh, is books and documentaries. We have our Alaba documentation here. Uh, so both of us uh, belong to, uh, come from a design background, and we're representing a large team of people that's worked in a collaborative capacity uh, to make these books and documentaries. Uh, I'd like to go back to how this happened because it's integral to why it happened and the process of then taking it on and subsequently producing this. Uh, this was in 2012. I was having a conversation across a table. Uh, at that point, not knowing that I was facing my 2B patron who commissioned me to make this project. We were talking about rivers and uh, I'd made some work comparing the Thames in London and the Ganga in Banaras. And I was just sharing this, and this was part of my school project, my dissertation while I was studying. And suddenly he goes, uh, why don't you document the kum? And in my head, uh, as somebody who does photography, it was like, wow, that's a great opportunity. But at the same time, this thought immediately crossed, you know, why will I willingly go to a stampede? Uh, and I expressed my hesitation on that front to him. And he looked at me, and uh, he sort of said, you are my target audience, and I want you to therefore document the Kumbh yourself with whoever you feel should engage in this landscape and can uh, experience it. Okay. I apologize, sorry. Sorry, I'm just going to take some technical help, yeah. OK, so um, that's how it all began. And now we are people who've never encountered this landscape. We're asked to make books. Uh, how would you make a book on something that you know nothing about? And so we were literally blank canvases. And we thought uh, we had about a month to kind of see what was around and published and present, and also make sense of what were our strengths and how would we go and do this on field. So what came to mind then is the only way that we thought we could do it is experience people, uh, uh, document experiences of people who are experiencing this in real time. So that's how uh, the approach of documentation is sort of oral history-ish. And to go out there on field and absorb as much as we can and speak to people ranging from uh, you know, Acharyas and Mahans of Akhadas to government officials who are uh, putting all the uh, uh, infrastructure in place for this to happen, to pilgrims and also some academics. So documentation across the three landscapes comprises of 275 conversations of people uh, spanning this whole gamut and experiencing it in real time. And why I would sort of say that uh, it is very diverse and rich is because these people are pl playing important roles to make the kumbh happen and also contributing to the way it unf unfolds. Um, 
I don't have the visuals here, but um, maybe I'll just carry on and share a few anecdotes. So to give you a sense of the kind of conversations we had, uh, we met a saint who described the kum and likened it to a, a university. He said that uh, this is a landscape where so many gurus uh, expounding different philosophies and different worldviews show up. And therefore, he also called it a philosophy mall. And one can enter any camp and absorb uh, or at least get a glimpse into what is going on. So one way of looking at the kumbh is that it is a university of life where one can um, you know, be exposed to so many worldviews and mindsets and ways of thinking and existing. Uh, to another end of the spectrum, uh, where we had a conversation with a pilgrim who could barely, I mean, we could barely speak a language that, you know, each of us could understand each other. And we said, you know, why did you come to the kum? And their response was like, how can you even ask such a question? Isn't it obvious that if you get an opportunity, you must come to the kum? So it was people who are really steeped in faith. And uh, as people curating this documentation, we have not made a distinction of who is more important over the other. So every encounter that we've had in the landscape, ranging from a Mark Tully who's in our books, to somebody who's a pilgrim, and to somebody who's a you know, curious visitor, all of, all of them sort of come together in these volumes, expressing their perspective and point of view of being here. Some of the insights from government officials, for example, the head of security and traffic control, who we met um, at the Kum, uh, Mr. Kavindra Pratap Singh, he, he talked to us about a simple strategy. He said that we have to make sure that there's constant circulation. He said a stoppage at one point is a potential stampede at another. So it literally is as simple as directing people, sometimes even in the wrong way, but to make sure that there's movement. So very, very basic, uh, but very integral strategies that came out through these conversations. The health and sanitation officer, uh, Mr. Ramesh Srivastava, who we spoke to, told us that the challenge was not to build temporary toilets for 80 million people, but the challenge was to get people to defecate in them. Because so many of these people who showed up uh, don't necessarily have the privilege of toilets in where they belong. So um, the range of conversations we had were very, very diverse with their own insights and entry points uh, into the landscape. We met Andrew, who is this Australian uh, boat builder who had come to the 2001 Kum as a visitor. And he told us about uh, how he was very inspired by the landscape and wanted to come back as a participant. So in the 2013 Kum, he came a month ahead of the start of the Kum, and he built a boat with a local community in Allahabad. And he was ferrying people up and down for free for the duration of the two months. And he got four of his young children there and said that, you know, this is the best landscape to school them. That is, that is the value he saw in the landscape. So now that we have the presentation, uh, not, okay. Okay, okay. All right, so this is uh, some of the uh, uh, slides which show you the scale. So the Kumbh is known for its scale, which is obviously true, 80 million people, a pop-up mega city, a pop-up city, because uh, it is on the floodplains of the Ganges, uh, which means that the whole city comes up when the water level recedes. Come rain, it is all underwater. Uh, these are the landscapes of uh, these are the landscapes of Trambakeshwar and Nasik. I'm sorry about this. Uh, yeah, please go next. That's uh, the Trambakeshwar landscape. Next. That's Ujjain. Next, please. Okay, so uh, as I said, uh, the focus of a lot of visual documentation of the books, of books and documentaries that we see is about the scale. And our attempt here is to understand who are these individuals that form the collective and what is it that brings them there. Uh, so please go next. Next. Keep rolling, please. These are just visuals that... Uh, were supporting what I just said. And these are our 275 conversations across the landscapes. We had 80 conversations in Allahabad. We had 155 in Nasik. And we had 40 in Ujjain. Um, please go next. 
these are pilgrims that I spoke about who talked to us and said, you know, don't ask such questions. <laughs> this is Kavindra Pratap Singh Ji, the head of security. That's Ramesh Rivastav, the head of health and sanitation. And that's Andrew with his boat named Karuna that he built. So uh, I'll just uh, sort of hand over to Sanjana at this point, uh, just saying that everything that we documented, the way we documented was as simple as this. There were conversations we had and people would tell us things that we did not understand. So after hearing them, we would seek them visually in the landscape. The other way uh, we did Sanjana, it. Sanjana, could you please fill that in? Yeah, yeah. I'll just yeah. conclude with this yeah. sentence. I think we are, yeah. 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 So uh, the other thing was, uh, we saw things, observed things that we didn't understand, and we would go back and ask people what it meant. So it was simply this, observing and sort of hearing, and that's how the whole gamut of uh, books and films have been made. I'll hand over to Sanjay. Yeah. Thank you. Next. So on field, there were two things that uh, we were following very strictly. Mon every morning, uh, there would be a member of our team who would go through all the local and national newspapers to you know, point us to various events and people that were spoken of so that we could go and encounter them in the scape. Um, and then um, we have uh, every evening when we came back at whatever time in the night, um, every member of our team had to do a diary log very strictly because uh, all the encounters and conversations they had had, they needed to put it down every day. Uh, this is very important for our project because this is what forms uh, the bibliography for our books. Um, and since our books are based on primary research, uh, we do refer to this over and over again whenever we do have to uh, talk of the kum. Um, if we can have the next slide. Um, basically, when we came back from the on-field documentation, Go back, please. Yeah. So basically, when we um, came back from uh, our on-field documentation, we, um, we knew that we had 80 conversations. And from these conversations, uh, is, uh, from these conversations, we got our content for the books. These were the voices of our books. And we started tagging these interviews uh, with different aspects that we realized were a part of the kum. And through this process, we came uh, to these eight aspects of the kum. Um, these are the eight volumes. Um, and um, these eight volumes answer one question, and these stand independently. So if you, have, uh, if you want to know more about the management at the kum, you can pick up uh, the eighth volume. Or you want to know more about the rivers in the scapes, uh, you can pick up the third volume. Um, we will show you a little bit about our visual language. Um, go back, please. Sorry. Yeah, so these are the eight colors we attributed to each of the books. And uh, if you go forward, you see uh, the eight books, uh, which are also here on the stage. Uh, if you go next, please. So the entire book has uh, eight different styles of each book has eight different styles of writing, and these appear across all the books. Uh, we have uh, we have poet. Okay, we have poetic verses. We have insights, reflections, interviews, photo stories, character stories, and diary notes. Um, so uh, these style of writing basically make the entire structure for the book. Um, just to give you a glimpse, here is. Um, Somebody called Scooter Baba, we encountered and saw him multiple times uh, during our stay there. And he would always appear on a candy stripe bright scooter and he would be wearing a different outfit every day. Uh, finally, we, were, uh, we had to go and ask him why he was doing this there. And his response was that uh, my way of serving God is to bring a smile on people's faces. And uh, yeah, that was his uh, story. And these uh, unusual stories that we encountered became a part of character story. This one can be seen, um, yeah. So the next story is, um, so if across the globe, when we have a holy, um, when we encounter holy water, people usually offer coins as offerings. And so that also happens at the Ganga. Uh, so we saw a group of uh, children uh, who are boatmen's kids. Uh, they have made this magnetic strip, and they would fling it into the water and fish out the coins. And this was documented by a team member uh, with photographs, and that became a, a, sto a photo story. 
and you can see that uh, photo story in one of the books, uh, book number eight. Uh, then if we go ahead, um, all the milkmen in um, Allahabad, early in the morning, uh, you will see them at the, on the bridge. And um, before they make their rounds for delivery, they will pour a measure of their faith which is um, into the Ganga, which is milk, and only then begin their rounds. So some, something like this uh, went into uh, the poetry um, aspect of the book. And you can see it in book number seven, which is Faith, Faith, and Worship. Um, similarly, if you go next, these are the interviews that she spoke about. And these conversations were put in as interviews in book number eight, which is on management. Um, so basically, this is what the content of a uh, book is. And uh, metaphorically, uh, we place this different aspects of the kum um, on a visual map of the sangam. Uh, it is not geographical, it is more metaphorical. And then the, uh, the different styles of writing were uh, marked by the flag. And when you put these two together, you could place yourself in the entire structure of the book. Uh, that is what the information architecture, that is how the information architecture for the book sets is. Uh, these are few spreads from the book. What we have tried to do is give context to images uh, throughout the eight volumes. And uh, yeah, this is just a few, this is how the books look all together. And then I can we uh, move on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, just one last thing, uh, can we go next? Uh, we'd like to leave you with this thought uh, as we conclude the, our project that uh, we see the world not as it is, but as we are, because that is how we have looked at the kum. Uh, that is our perspective of presenting the kum through the books and the documentary. Yeah, and we see ourselves as facilitators and not authors. We're not the authors of the books. The voices are the authors. We're only facilitating and compiling this. They're not the authors. And Deshna has also told me, yeah, please, yeah, give them a hand. That's a tremendous amount of documentation. Yeah. Uh, they're not the authors of the book. They say very modestly, they're only the compilers, the designers, the publishers. Anugraha, uh, that is the name of the organization. And they've asked me to clarify that if you want, if you're looking for a publisher for your next novel, uh, uh, they are not the persons to go to. They do only this kind of thing. Also. Um, I don't know whether they will one day uh, be sponsored, as they were this time, to undertake a similar documentation of the JLF. <laughs> that would be very revealing anthropologically. <laughs> you know, there is, there is a Hindi doha about holy congregations. Chitrakoot ke ghat par bhai santan ki bheer, tulasi da se chandan ghisay, tilak de tarakubir. This can be rephrased. J L F K ghat par bhai shotan ki bheer sunne walu ki bheer hui. Lekha ke gana chandan ghis hai. Jitne lekha ke wo chandan ghis rahe hai. Atilak deet raghu bheer. Bhagawan ki kripa se hi hum log ikattha ho rahe hai. Aur wo chandan laga rahe hai aapko. There's one other thing I'd say before. The one project represented by these two speakers Another large anthropological project represented by the next set of two speakers. In between, let me raise one little point about where the present kumb is being held. Is it in Allahabad or is it in Prayagraj? That has been a point of much discussion and debate. My own sense is, as I said, I am an old Allahabadi. But the kumb is being held in Prayagraj. The kumbh cannot be held in Allahabad. The kumbh has to be held in Prayagraj with all his connotations. I was shocked to read. You know, there is much controversy about the change of name, and there is much to be controverted. Many reasons, good reasons. At the same time, we come to such sweeping conclusions and declamations. I read in print in one of those interventions that Prayagraj, the name, had just been invented that this is a neologism. Now, the profundity of the ignorance of some of our confident commentators on these cultural questions never ceases to amaze me. The name Allahabad began in the times of Akbar, Akbar the Great. Before that, it was Prayagraj. So we've had 500 years of Allahabad. 
But we've also had 500 years at the same time of Prayag. In Prayag, there is a railway station called Allahabad. There is another railway station called Prayag. There is the Prayag Sangeet Samiti, which has been one of the great institutions of music, classical music. There is the Prayag Mahila Vidya Peet. There are many institutions named Prayag, even while Allahabad has been the dominant name. But before Akbar, this name is not invented. Where did Rama go according to Valmiki? Did he go to Allahabad? No, he went to Prayag. Where did Rama go according to Tulsidas? Bharatwaj Muni Basahi Prayaga. He went to the Bharatwaj Ashram, where uh, the Ganga flew by the Bharatwaj Ashram, which Nehru also mentions, Jawaharlal, in his autobiography. He saw these huge religious crowds. Just opposite Bharatwaj Ashram is Anand Bhavan, which Mutilal Nehru built at the new Nehru house after he gifted the Swaraj Bhavan next door to the nation. And Jawaharlal Nehru asked these people, what is your faith? Who do you believe in? What makes you come in such large numbers? And when you shout Bharat Mata ki jai, how does Bharat Mata join the same pantheon of gods and goddesses? So there is a long and complex history behind it. Tulsi Das also said, ko kahi sakaya prayag prabhau. The mahatma, the importance, the mahima of prayag is beyond description. And why is it not called Prayag, but Prayag Raj? It's not like the British Raj. It has different connotations. And the reason for that, according to Sanskrit etymology and usage, is Satirtha Rajo Jayatu Prayag. Prayag is the Raja of all the Tirth San. The king, the supreme Tirth San, the supreme destination of pilgrimage. That's why Prayag Raj. And of course, Allahabad will still continue, will come drippingly off our tongues, but we need to recognize that Prayagraj is not a recent invention. If anything, Allahabad is recent and Prayagraj is ancient. Daniela, Hi. to speak about your interest in the Kumbh yes, and where yes. you come from. Yes. To um, it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for me, the Kumbh Mela was always a kind of uh, fieldwork research because I do research among sadhus. So it was always the best place to go for meeting sadhus and researching about them. But of course, I consider the kumb also a kind of private experience because uh, you can imagine to be in the kumb mela. And I think um, the, the, the Shah is none of Mauni Amavasya of the Maha Kumbh Mela 2013 will remain forever one of the most intense experience of my life because you were talking about Stampede and I was going to the Sangam to take bath with a group of the Jagat Guru Ramananda Charya Ramnareshwa Charya and we arrived to the, the, the point in which we had to cross this river of human beings flowing towards the Ganga and I was shocked and I was thinking like okay I'm gonna die today that was the first idea but then I was able to cross and to walk because there was this uh, help. Everybody was helping each other to continue and to be part of that flowing humanity and to take bath with so many people really was something that overwhelmed me. And uh, I think uh, taking bath or attend the Kumbh Mela during the Shahistan is really an incredible experience that, uh, I mean, I don't know if I can suggest to everybody but uh, it's uh, really something uh, unique. But of course I do, and I go to the Kumbh Mela for uh, doing my research, and uh, I spend a lot of time with sadhus. So I'm not going now to talk about my meeting with the sadhus and my research, but I want to stress two important issues that uh, can help us to understand the dynamics of the Kumbh Mela, and uh, even the, um, and the soul of the Kumbh Mela. And these two issues are the social role of sadhus during the Kumbh Mela and the political issues that uh, are there before the Kumbh Mela and during the Kumbh Mela. And I think uh, the social role of the sadhus in the Kumbh Mela is very much important because you can really understand the meaning of Seva Samaj, like the, um, the, um, the support and um, 
and the help of the society that the sadhu give during the mela. And I think this can be described in three actions. The sadhu talk, feed, and host people. And this is incredible because the, the, during the Kumbh Mela, everybody can just sit close to the duni of a Baba and ask questions. And uh, every, any kind of question can be religious or spiritual, but even advice about normal life. And, um, and, and this is something that um, during the Mela has, has a huge impact on people, even though, I mean, as you were saying before, uh, today many more people are asking for selfies instead of questions to the Baba. So it's like a very fast darshan, Babaji photo, tak, and then they, they go. So it's, it's quite a bit weird. So that is why they have a lot of time to spend with me. And uh, I was very glad about that. And, uh, but on the other side, there is this uh, uh, service of feeding people that is striking for me because anytime you can go at lunchtime in a tent of a Baba and there will be food for you. And there are bandaras, like this feast going from morning to evening and thousands of people will get for free food. And I think this is something very shocking for, well, I mean, if you come from outside and you see that everybody can eat, and of course they host people because you can go to the tent of a Baba, of course not Naga Babas, maybe for a woman, of course. I mean, they have the Mahivara, but it's another story. And you can ask the Babas to stay in the tent and to spend the night there, and you will be hosted. And I think this is a very interesting feeling that creates this kind of, uh, um, I would say, friendship uh, between human beings. And I think it's very important. It, it represents the core soul, maybe, of the, of the Kumbh Mela. Everybody's helping each other, and it's uh, very much uh, touching for me. But of course, if you go to the Mela, you also understand the politics going on there, because who can camp in the Mela, where the different camps are located, depends on power relations. And of course, during the Mela, you can see this kind of geographic hierarchy, because who is the most powerful Akara, and who is the most powerful Sadhus, you can read in the different sectors. And um, another point that I want to stress is that the powers can be dealt with during the Mela. And this was very much striking in this Arda Kumbh Mela. I don't know if you knew about the Kinnarakara. And because uh, maybe you don't know this, but at the beginning of January, there was an historical event that happened. Because usually there are 13 uh, traditional Akaras. And uh, this here, the Kinnar Akara, that is this new Akara organized by Lakshmi Narayan Tripathi, it's an Akara of uh, Kinnars, of Ijras, was, uh, um, was able to um, sign an agreement and to be recognized by the Juna Akara. So why this happened? Because during the day uh, Devta Yatra, the Peshwai, they had an incredible support by the local people. There were thousands of people going for receiving their blessing. And because the support they got during the Peshwai, and because there are so many people going to their camp every day, the Juna Akara had to create a compromise. So they accepted the Kinnarakara, and this really uh, made a change in the history of the Kumbh Mela, because now the schedule of the Shahisnan is different. So now the Kinnarakara will uh, go to take bath immediately after the Avahanakara and the Panchagniakara. So before all the ancient traditional order. So you really can understand how the Kumbh Mela can create a new field of interaction between social, between lay people, and other sadhus. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> Very nice. <Yeah. laughs> you know, even amongst holy men, they will be jostling for space, and they will be jostling for precedence. In fact, the word Akhara uh, itself has many connotations. Is Pahalwani, as we know, all Pahalwans assemble at Akhalas, uh, powerful wrestlers. 
But there's also a holy connotation. All sadhus are organized into akhalas. And from what I have read, there is a history of peaceful coexistence among them, as well as similar conflicts about which is the more important akhara. And uh, there is also a history of conflict, not only amongst themselves, but against forces outside the faith, some militancy in the past. And that's why they have horses and swords and elephants to some extent. So there is a complicated history of organization of any religion. But one thing that you may have wondered about is, what happens to these Akhalas outside the Kumbh? What happens to these Nagababas outside the Kumbh? They are obliged to come to one place together at the time of the Kumbh, but then they disappear. Then they are not to be seen. Then they are in a small ascetic space where they are left to themselves because that is the kind of life they prefer to lead. They come into visibility only at these congregations most of the time or when disciples with faith approach them at those akhalas. To tell us about other dimensions of the kump, as somebody who's also in there in many ways, James Mallinson. Thank you very much, Harish. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll start by, I mean, my, I suppose with zooming in here, because I, I have a sort of somewhat uh, narrower view or narrower uh, a story to tell you about the Qum from my personal experience, which you know, really is right in the, from the heart of the camps. I first went to a, a Qum in 1992 in Ujjain, and I went with a very specific purpose of uh, finding myself a guru. And in fact, people often uh, contact me and say, you know, where can I find a good yoga teacher? Where can I find a guru? I say, well, the best place to go, where you have the, the most on display, the most available, you've got the biggest choice, is at, at the Kumbh Mela. And that's what I did in, in 92, and through a, a series of um, coincidences, strange occurrences, some might say Purva Janamka Sanskar, I ended up in, in a Vairagi camp, and, uh, and then after a, a couple of weeks there, I got kidnapped by this very charismatic Tyagi Baba, and initiated on the, on the banks of the Narmada River in Omkareshwar. And so he became my, my Guruji, and still is my Guruji, and I spent... Uh, a great deal of the next 10 years living and traveling with him in India, and also went to every single Kumbh Mela. And I've been to more or less every Kumbh since. Um, now, the function of the Kumbh for these Akharas, it's not just, I mean, as you said, there's a historically up to about 1800, there was a lot of fighting at the Kumbh Melas over the precedence of the bathing order, order between the different Akharas. Um, but then the British took control at the beginning of the 19th century. And that order has been fixed since then. Still, though, it's important for the individual Akaras to turn up to, uh, to stake their claim to their position in the hierarchy. And then within the Akaras as well, it's very important for the individual sadhus and yogis to turn up and stake their place within the hierarchy of their Akara. And that's, on the, sort of, that's the kind of organizational reason for the, for the sadhu camps being there. Of course, there's also the, the, the spiritual reason, which is to bathe on these auspicious days. At the current Mela, there are three main bathing days, and, and it's on those days that the Akaras will parade and go in procession to, to bathe in the order that has been fixed now for 200 years. Although, I mean, what Daniela was talking about just now is extremely significant, I think, the fact that we've now got the first new Akara in 200 years, this Kinara Akara. And what I, d I don't think she said, I mean, m most people in the audience will appreciate this, but actually the, the Kinara Akara consists of, of trans transgender people. So it's, uh, you know, it's kind of resonating very globally as well. You know, this is a great uh, a hot topic around the world now, and I think India really is showing that it's at the cutting edge of this by uh, institutionalizing a, a religious group of, of transgender people. But then, the, so to bring it right down to what's going on within the individual camps, um, the sadhus themselves, so when someone becomes a sadhu, they renounce their family, and they, their, the, their guru becomes like their father, and their co-disciples are like their brothers. They call them guru bhai, so guru brother. And then you have the wider, you know, then you're 
your guru's guru bai is your chacha guru, your uncle. So that it's, it's a family, effectively. So they, having renounced their initial original family, they then adopt a new family by becoming a sadhu. Um, and as Harish was saying, most of the time, you know, the three years between each Kumbh Mela, the sadhus are all in their, in their ashrams or they're wandering around going to pilgrimage places and they don't see that much of each other. They might bump into each other. But then they all come together for the Mela. So it's like a, a big family gathering. And it has its celebrations, particularly when they go to bathe. You know, it's, there's a lot of there's the, the dancing, and you see the, the films, particularly the Naga Babas, you'll see them dancing away, and they're, they're celebrating. But also, of course, you know, when any family comes together, there are a few disputes and arguments as well. And it's a time for, for settling those disputes, sometimes settling scores as well. You know, I've known people have, I've known sadhus have fights because one guy will turn up and say, hey, you came to my ashram when you were on pilgrimage and you disrespected me and they'll settle a score like that. Um, it's also the time for institutional um, you know, promotions. In fact, I was honored in 2013 at the last Prayag Kumbh Mela, I was honored with the title of Mahant. It was a sort of honorary uh, thing and that's the kind of first level of promotion um, within, the, w within, the, within the tradition. Um, and that comes with, so the only reason I could do that was because I've turned up at lots of these Kumbh Melas, the sadhus in my camp know that I'm Paka. They know that I'm not, uh, you know, a full-on sadhu. You can see I'm not wearing the, the, the correct clothes. And it was kind of a, an honor, perhaps, for my scholarly work on the Sampradaya. But I, you, in order to maintain that position, you have to maintain the respect of your Sampradaya or your Akara. And I often get asked... As I say, I, I, people ask me about where to find a guru and so forth, and I say, well, if you go to a Kumbh Mela and you see a sadhu has a prominent position, he's sitting at the front of the camp, or you know, he's able to maintain his, his duni, his area, and he's respected by his peers, that's the key thing. He is almost certainly going to be pucker, because this is a, is a kind of peer review goes on at the Melas as well. And I, I'm reflecting on this recently in the context, because my, my work at the moment, my research work, uh, is on the history of yoga. We've, I'm working on that with Daniela. And many of you might know that there's been a lot of scandals over recent years within various yoga schools and so forth because these great gurus, both in the West and in India, you know, they achieve this position of power. And then, of course, there's nothing restraining them. They're, 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 they're on their own. You know, they, they're not usually part of this broader sadhu samaj where there's this kind of peer review system. Um, and so there's no one to, to cut them down, and I think that is part of the reason. Um, and I've seen this in action. I've seen that, so the, the, the sadhu that gave me my name when I first turned up at the camp in Ujjain in 92, he wasn't the one who became my guru, but he was an important Sri Mahant at that time. But then over the sub subsequent years, he had inherited a, a, an ashram in, in Rajasthan, in fact, at Mount Abu, but he then hooked up with a woman, which is, you know, it's, this is a celibate yogi tradition, and he also sold his ashram in Abu. Now, that's, this is sort of seen as a very, very bad thing to do within the Sampradaya, because this is a, a property as part of the tradition. And he, was, he wasn't cast out, his title hasn't been removed, but no one goes to his camp anymore. So when I first met him, he was there sitting surrounded by lots of other sadhus and and devotees and foreigners coming to see him. Now he's a very sort of sad figure who sits on his own at the corner of, of the camp. Um, so I think it, it's, a, it's a very, the, the kumbh, you know, as well as all these other things going on, the bathing and the processions and, and so forth, and there's a big tamasha go, going on around it. That, I think, within the tradition, this is the most important function. It preserves the tradition, it preserves the rules of the, the sadhu, sadhu traditions. And, I think I'll stop. There. Uh, we got a fair idea of the project that. Uh, uh, yeah, please. <laughs> uh, we got an idea of the project that Deshna and Sanjana have undertaken and have brought to fruition, more or less. Your research project, the large research project, is an ongoing project in which Daniela is also involved. What is the title of that project? The project is called the Hatha Yoga Project. Yeah. Um, and so we've got, we're sort of two-thirds of the way through a five-year project mm -hmm. funded by the European Research Council, in fact. And the core of it is, is, is Sanskrit texts, 
Um, we are editing 10 texts on Hatha Yoga, but then that's being complemented by field work amongst yogis. And that's another thing I should say, you know, is that as well as, you know, I went to that first Kumbh Mela in 92 as both a, a seeker and a scholar, um, because not only, you know, is it the, the, the world's best sort of guru supermarket, but it's also, and as you were saying, Harish, before, all these yogis, they spend the three years in between off in their, in their ashrams or whatever, but then they come back together. So it's the best place to go around and do your field work because, you know, you'll meet the yogis from Kutch in Gujarat and yogis from Assam and, or, 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 or the far south and so forth. So Daniela has been doing great work over the last few years, traveling around, yep. meeting yogis in their various ashrams, but then also now when they come together at the Mela, she's been interviewing You know, one thought well. that struck me, as these two large research projects were being described and we being presented to you, what is the proper research procedure in, for an anthropologist? He has to go to the site, he has to do what is called field work, he has to embed himself or herself in the situation, in the context, and yet, is it scientific or is it not scientific to develop some kind of an identification with the project to have it rub off on you or does that vitiate and compromise the research? Must one remain aloof from what other people believe, what other people practice or must one or can one, should one actually uh, step into it and take a dupki? As they say at the Sangam, as they do at the Sangam, take a dip, a deep dip and come out dripping. We'll go into that perhaps, but let's have some questions from the audience uh, for the next few minutes before we sum up this session. Any questions, please, and identify the person to whom you are addressing a question. Uh, yeah, in the front. And will you please be brief? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, my name is Dr. Kailas Gupta. Uh, I'm from the International Emergency Management Society and we are disaster management partner of the Jaipur Literature James. Festival. Yeah, I'm James. No, no, I'm giving the count. So, <clears throat> so James, my question is, you have been to so many Kums, so last also uh, Nasik, and uh, I, I'm not sure whether you have been to Allahabad this time. My question is, from the disaster management perspective, crowd management, um, what are your reactions? Is it well managed or... There are a lot of lacunas, or what can, could we learn? Thank you. Um, I, I haven't yet been this year, but Daniela has. But my experience in the past, I mean, I'm, I'm going after here. I'm going for the, 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 the next two snans. But my experience in past comes is that it's extremely well managed, uh, the, the desire. I mean, it, you know, there are hundreds, possibly 100 million people going. And occasionally, there are small mishaps. I don't want to be, you know, too, uh, take those too lightly, and people get you know, I think it was Allahabad six years ago, there was a bridge collapsed at the railway station, wasn't there? But since, we were talking about this earlier beforehand, since 1954 when there was a big crush and it was a horrible disaster and several hundred people were killed. Um, since then, I mean, I think the, the state government, the central government realized that unless they really throw everything at this and organize it extremely well, there is going to be utter chaos and they really do. And it shows you that when there's, where there's a will, there's a way. And in my experience, I mean, Sometimes, you, sometimes it's frustrating because you have to walk in one, you know, you can only walk one way. You join a river of humanity when you're going to bathe and it can be a long, circuitous route and it can take you hours to get to the bathing gut. But that's probably a small price to pay for there not being stampedes and crushes. Good morning, everybody. My question is for Daniela. I know you gave us a good insight into your perception of the kum. But what are the two main things that you can carry back to your country? To my country, okay. Uh, well, as I said before, I mean, this uh, feeling of, uh, I don't know if I can say the, the word friendship, but it's actually like that. Because when you enter the Mela and you are a foreigner, of course, everybody's like, welcome to the Kumbh Mela. Uh, are you happy? Everything is okay? I'm like, yeah, but yeah, koi dikkat nahi hai, chalo, chalo. <laughs> so it's like that. And uh, of course, as uh, I can speak Hindi, and uh, as uh, Arish was saying, you know, like as an anthropologist, I think um, one has to always uh, carry the idea of being very humble. 
when facing the sadhus and these kind of uh, situations. And uh, what I bring back is actually this uh, feeling of being able to sit with the babas and sharing with them and learning from them. Even if, uh, of course, today's is not such a, um, I mean, as I said also before, the satsang is not going on uh, like uh, as um, in, I think, in a few decades ago. Even I was talking with James Guru and he was, uh, concerned about this, like before you could come and the satsang was helpful and you could learn and today people just want, you know, to smoke chillum with the babas and uh, taking photographs. But if you have time to spend time with the sadhus, then you can learn a lot. And this is everything I, I bring back to my country together with um, kichri and puri and alu matar and all this lovely food, yes, simply. <laughs> Is the menu there better than here? I mean, I, came, I just came back after three weeks of the Kumbh Mela, and this was a very good uh, variety. I mean, I'm happy about to be here and to change a bit the diet, of course. The lady at the back there with the mic, yeah, over there, volunteer, right at the back. Hello. Yep. Thank you. Yep. And after that, you. After that, you. Yep. Uh, my question is to James. You know, in India, uh, there's so many gurus and so many saints which you find. How do you even figure out who's authentic and who isn't? That was one. And the second is, where do they get their knowledge from? I mean, is there a school or is it something which is passed down? What is your experience of that? Um, well, who's, I mean, authentic obviously is a difficult word because, I mean, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a very ancient tradition, but also everyone's sadhus are innovating as they go along. But as I said before, I think that if, you know, if you're concerned about finding someone pucker who's not fake, if they are held in esteem by their peers, by the other sadhus within their tradition, that's a pretty good sign. You know, that's, that's, as I said, that's what I say to people asking me about that. Um, and, sorry, what was the second question? It was the, oh, the, yeah, how does the knowledge get passed on? Um, well, Generally, I mean, I think that's a big difference, actually. Uh, something we've seen as, as I mean, looking at it, particularly from the angle of yoga, for example, uh, in the past and still to this day, within the sadhu lineages, so, so my guru's guru, for example, well, his, his guru was a famous sadhu called Dev Raha Baba, who, who used to live on a machan and you know, had all these uh, famous devotees. And then, so my dada guru, he had 75 sadhu disciples, but only, and he was a great yogi, but only two of them did he teach yoga to. And they lived, so my guru lived with him 24 hours a day for seven years and learned the, you know, the complete lifestyle of how to live as a yogi. And now we have this very different scenario where you have these big yoga classes with one teacher and you know, sometimes hundreds of people following their movements. Um, so I think in that way, the tradition gets massively diluted and... Um, so yeah, that's, I think, uh, uh, traditionally, it's a very close one-on-one -on -one transmission of, of knowledge. Does anyone have a, one, mo one moment. Does anyone have a question to Deshna or Sanjana? Yep. Uh, sorry, my question is In the interest of democracy, <laughs> I think, uh, no, I'm really sorry. you have a question to them? No, uh, Daniel or James. Quickly, please, uh, yep. <laughs> uh, my question is, um, हम भारत में नास्तिकता की भी अपनी एक ट्रेडिशन है लेकिन आई थिंक यू बोथ आर अंडरस्टैंडिंग हिंदी ना भारत में नास्तिकता की भी एक अपनी ट्रेडिशन है लेकिन वो भी स्पिरिचुअलिटी के साथ जुड़ के ही आता है जैसे बुद्धिज्म चार वाक और चर्क एंड ऑल दैट ट्रेडिशंस एंड स्कूल्स एंड सेक्स uh, but in now uh, days in India, there is a, a implanted nastikta from European, European implanted nastikta. Uh, but Europe uh, obsessed hai, uh, Indian faith, ke, Indian religious spirituality. Ke bare mein. To ye jo Bharat okay, ke log, my question that. is, ah. Bharat ke logo mein aaj ke samay, jo je implanted European nastikta hai, apni tradition ki nastikta ko chhodke, usko ap dono kaise dekhte hain? Well, I think I don't think it's fair to say that the, the, the nast, nastikta comes from Europe. You know, there's a very old tradition of you know the charvakas, the lokayatas in in India. Um, so I don't think you can necessarily blame blame that on us Europeans. Um, 
I think if one goes to the Kumbh Mela, there's not a lot of nastikta in evidence. Hello. Uh, I have a little story. Uh, Deshna told us about how the boatman's kids pick out the coins from the river. Um, I learned this story recently in Kumbh Mela. I was there for a while, uh, the ongoing Kumbh Mela. So what they told me was that the tradition started after Tamba coins came in vogue. Now, Tamba has been used in India as a kind of a cure for, I mean, in Tamba vessels are used to store water and then you drink it. And it kind of heals you. So, people used to put Tamba in the river to make it more purified. So, that is how the tradition came. Today's uh, world is different. The, tam the Tamba is no longer used for. So, this is a small story. So, I wanted to share with Deshna. Thank you. Thank you. I don't, no, I don't know about so that. Thank one you. last question, gentlemen in the hat. Yeah. Uh, this is for Daniela. Um, I'm not looking for a guru, but I want to go. Can I go to Varanasi, get in a taxi and go like this? Yeah. I mean, I would just suggest you not to go for the Shahi Znan on the 4th because there will be too many people, the cars will be stopped like kilometers far from the entrance. So just go... I would suggest the seventh, yeah, the seventh, the sixth, but uh, yeah, yeah, you can go like easily, no problem at all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can give you my number if I am around. I can help you like managing the sectors. Uh, it's a huge. It's it's this this Kumbh Mela is huge, so I, I had to get a bicycle. Yeah. Because otherwise it was impossible. And the rickshaw, the e-rickshaw are chored because they ask a lot of money. Really, really. So if you want <laughs> to go, nice. just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we've had a wonderfully rich session. And by way of concluding, we may perhaps have one or two more reflections to go away with. There has been, I mean, the tremendous amount of research and documentation that we have just been exposed to that's been projected and presented to us is quite mind-boggling. But it is a huge event. And it is like the six blind men describing an elephant and getting hold of one part and describing that as being more interesting or more central than the other. But the other question that comes to my mind is, beyond the documentation, beyond the research, there are things that do not meet the eye. The visuals seem to tell us everything, but the visuals can only go so far. The visuals do not go inside us, not yet, except in a biological sense. Psychologically, spiritually, in terms of faith, the description of the Kumbh Mela and what happens there has perhaps to be along somewhat different lines, and uh, there is plenty written about it, not only mythologically, the mythological origins, the pot of nectar, how drops from it fell at four different places, and so on. But one last thing I'd say to you is what I began with. Those who come here do not go to the other kumbh, and those who go to the other kumbh, most of them are among those who have never heard of the JLF. This is a departure point, perhaps, for the other question, which is, who goes to the Kumbh there apart from researchers? If there are 150 million people congregating there, the researchers may be 1,000, 5,000, 10,000. The documentary. The people who go there are people with faith, with people who believe that their pap will actually be washed away, they will earn a purnia, and they'll be closer to moksha after bathing there. I was speaking to a Dalit writer yesterday with whom I was on a different panel, and he said he has not been to the Kumbh, but his mother is camping there for a whole month. And the grandmother, actually, after several years of Kumbh, just went away from home and took sannyas. That is the kind of faith that moves 150 million people, most of them, to go there 
and in bitter cold have a dip in the river at four in the morning. And I think even if we do not go there, we should perhaps extend our imagination and our understanding to comprehend what makes them do that. That will be the coming together of these two kumbhas. Thank you all very much. And thank you, the four speakers. Thank you again for the lovely, lovely session on Kum, the greatest gathering on earth. A big round of applause for Daniela, James Melanson, Deshna, Sanjana, and of course for Harish Trivedi for conducting the session so beautifully. Thank you so much for being here.